What's up guys, today Dirt Lifestyle, we're gonna cover a topic that I get asked about pretty much nonstop, and that is comparing the different types of straight axle suspension design. Suspension design is everything to an off-roader. This is just as important as shocks, tires, anything that can get you over the next obstacle and to the end of the trail. Today I'm gonna to start with what is probably one of the most popular aftermarket options in terms of like a long arm upgrade, and that is radius arms. Radius arms have been used for decades by OEM and aftermarket manufacturers for one main reason, simplicity of packaging. Because your upper control arm, which is in green, connects to the lower control arm in red, you only have to deal with uh, mounting your lower control arms onto the chassis. Whereas if you had your upper control arms mounted to the chassis too, those upper control arms want to fight for space with all kinds of other things. If you've got a big V8 and you've got your downpipes coming down right next to your frame rails, if you have an upper control arm in the way, uh, that's a problem. Or if you've got a big diesel engine, you've got a giant starter that gets really close to your frame rail, same issue. You're gonna have a control arm that's gonna wanna fight for that space. So this makes it really easy for OEM manufacturers to package around those kinds of variables. And the aftermarket manufacturers like this as well because if you've got a short arm and they wanna build a kit that makes it to where you can convert it to a long arm, this makes it to where it's easier for them to convert. They can just send you a cross member or a couple brackets, just two brackets to weld onto your frame and now you're pretty much off to the races. So this is very popular for simplicity. Now, the downside of radius arms is that it's not very tunable. So if you want to be able to change the way your pinion acts throughout its travel, that is not something that you can adjust with um, separation of your upper and lower control arms like you would with a traditional forelink. So with a traditional forelink, this link mounts up here and now you can tune it and it'll change the way your pinion acts or the way your caster acts by separating these links or by shortening, or, uh, shortening that upper link. So you don't have any of that flexibility with a radius arm, but nine times out of 10 for most people, this actually works really well. And it's a very universal style of suspension. Um, one thing that I have seen people say is that it doesn't flex as well, but I, I haven't seen that in, in, in my own experience. And I actually ran radius arms on my TJ for over 10 years. And whenever I did the metal cloak flex machine thing that everybody does, I got like an 1156. It was a crazy number. It had a lot of flex. And then I went to a flex competition and actually got first place against two buggies and every everything else that you could see mild to wild out there. And that was with radius arm suspension. The big downside of radius arm, aside from the fact that it's not tunable, is that you go through your consumable parts a lot faster. So I was replacing my bushings on the radius arm like every six months to a year because I wheel and drive it a lot. Um, so eventually I got out of this suspension, I went to something more tunable, but for a lot of people, this is a great option. A good enough option for so many people, in fact, that many OEM manufacturers like Ford and Land Rover use this for a long period of time in a lot of different vehicles. This is the axle for my 2003 Land Rover Discovery, and when I was thinking about this video, I decided to leave the suspension on whenever I was removing this axle. So you can see this is a factory radius arm, we've got two mounts on the chassis side, and then on the axle side, we have a mount on on the rear of the axle and a mount on the front of the axle. But aftermarket suspension companies usually place the joint on the top and the bottom instead of the front and the back. This Cherokee belongs to my friend Robbie with Muddy Beards. And we built this suspension probably what, like four or five years ago? It's been a while. Four or five years ago. And a lot of folks say that these are high maintenance, but we were just talking about it. How many times have you replaced a joint or a bushing? I've never replaced a joint or bushing at all. All I do is grease the Endorio joints because they have little zerts, and um, I spray lithium grease on the nine joints, that's it. At the end of the day, the radius arm setup is very practical for a lot of builds, so it shouldn't be ruled out just because there are 
better things out there. If you're someone who has packaging issues, a radius arm is a great way to go. But the next step up is being able to go to a parallel four link or a three link front suspension because you have the ability to tune. What I mean by that, and I know I've already touched on this a couple times in the video, is because you change the upper and lower control arms around, you change the relationship between the two, you now have the ability to tune the way your axle acts throughout the suspension travel. This is huge, that's why I keep touching on it. So Jeep, if Jeep wants to make something that is good at everything, great at nothing, so right out of the box, they can send a Jeep to almost anywhere in the world and it'll do decent off-road, they can tune for that with this system. If you're an aftermarket manufacturer building buggies for desert, you can tune for that. If you wanna build something for rocks, you can tune for that. All of those orientations will change based on what the purpose is. And with a four link, you have the ability to change that. With a radius arm, you do not have that ability. Now let's talk about a three link versus a four link. I get asked about this all the time. The only difference between a four link, which is what we're looking at here, and a three link is that you lose one of your upper control arms and it's for packaging purposes. So if you've got your exhaust coming down on this side, or you've got, it's too crazy for your drive shaft throughout the suspension travel on your driver's side, you can lose one of your upper links in order to make some clearance for that issue that you're having. Um, the big difference in performance is basically just strength. So the way this flexes, everything else is gonna be identical to a four link. It, it doesn't flex more because you lose that upper link. But if you've got a thousand horsepower, um, you know, crazy rock bouncer, that has 44 inch stickies and you love to just go full throttle up rock ledges and stuff, you need a fourth link. I wouldn't trust a three link for a super high horsepower application. But for the average Joe like me or you that likes to go on trails or go on really hard rock obstacles with, you know, 300 or less horsepower, I think that a three link works great for most of us. This 2003 Land Rover Discovery is a perfect example of a tunable front parallel three link. So for those of you who are new, there's three different holes there, and the reason for that is tuning. I can make little adjustments by changing the position of that arm in those holes, and that will change the way this front axle acts and the different types of terrain and how it acts throughout the suspension travel. On the frame side, I have another bracket that looks just like that, so I can change the position on the frame side as well and, and really fine tune the way I want this to perform on and off road. As you can see, I built this bracket into the front truss on this axle to make sure that it's super strong because I don't have a fourth link in order to give it the extra strength. And something else I haven't mentioned is that with a parallel three link or four link, you still need to run a pan hard bar. And that brings me to my next suspension style. The double triangulated four link. This system is awesome because you can get rid of your pan hard bar due to the fact that it has this opposing triangular pattern between the upper and lower control arms. This is a system that takes a lot of skill in order to build it correctly, but when done correctly, it works outstanding. You don't have any sort of a flex steer scenario or anything like that. And if you have enough patience and you have enough space, this is something that is well worth the extra work. This is my buddy Caps Jeep. He's been building it for a while and it's a really good example of a few different things. The double triangulated four link in the rear is amazing and it works awesome, but this is a good example as to why you don't see it very often in the front. He's got an LS swap up here and there's just no room to make a double triangulated four link work here. So what he did is just a standard parallel four link and this is what you see in most front end applications, either a parallel four link or a parallel three link. In either instance, this is because of packaging constraints. It's very difficult to make a double four, triangulated four link work in the front of your chassis, unless you're building like a custom buggy and you can build your frame and everything from scratch. I know a bunch of you are wondering, is the double triangulated four link the only way to build a suspension and eliminate the pan hard bar? And it's not, we actually have a few options. The most popular of the pan hard bar less suspension systems is probably semi-triangulated four link or single triangulated four link. So you have one triangular pattern, which is your upper control arms and the lower control arms are ran in parallel. Super simple, it's a little bit easier for packaging and you don't need a pan hard bar. I think this is a great option for a lot of people. The downside is that you will get roll steer or flex steer and this could bother you or it could not bother you. What happens is whenever the axle flexes, um, one wheel will travel up and down, the other one will go opposite and then the axle will actually pivot side to side just a little bit giving you a flex steer scenario. This is something that I think is overstated. I've built multiple vehicles like this. I've never noticed an instance where I was like, wow, I'm steering from the rear of the vehicle because 
it, the, the when, especially when you have longer links, it's something that barely occurs. But it is worth talking about as to why doing a double triangulated four link is better than a single because a double triangulated four link does not have this problem. The next suspension I wanna talk about is a wishbone three link. And this is something that comes stock in some vehicles and it's not a bad option. It is a true three link. There's no pan hard bar and you're combining the upper two control arms to one big control arm. Now I have this drawn in a triangle, but you have a lot of flexibility if you needed to get around something. So the way the, um, the KJ or Jeep Liberty is set up is it doesn't have this cross bar going across here. It's basically just a big V shape. And that's not uncommon. People build all kinds of really cool orientations of this. You could put two links on the axle and one on the chassis or whatever. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Not a bad option, but I do hear that this has worse flex steer than the semi-triangulated four link. I've got really no way to test that, um, but it's just something that's worth looking into if you're gonna consider this kind of suspension. The last one we're gonna talk about is the Watts link. I think the Watts link is really cool, but I can't imagine a scenario where I would use it. Um, this is, it's an alternative to a pan hard bar, right? <laughs> Technically, but it gives the same issue with having to locate a pan hard bar. And now you have to locate two separate arms. What happens is whenever this um, axle goes up and down throughout its travel, there's like three joints right here. And this will kind of wiggle back and forth and keep the axle centered. It's, it's a cool design. It's just a little more complicated than I think you need, especially for a four by four. I could see if you wanna do a really low center of gravity build, this could be a cool option uh, because you might be able to package this easier than a pan hard bar potentially. Uh, or if you're building a chassis for a muscle car or I've, I've seen mini trucks use stuff like this. So it's not a bad option for those kinds of things, but if you're building something from scratch, I think that these other ones are a little bit better and a little bit easier. Now you do still need upper control arms and I drew two little radius arms here because if I was gonna build a Watts link, it would definitely be to free up space right here in front of the rear axle. You know, big muffler, uh, you can even, some people mount air systems on the inside of their uh, frame rails and whatnot, and you can free all that space up if you just ran radius arms with a Watts link. So there's an application where it might make sense for you. For me, I usually stick to a semi-triangulated four link and in a future build coming up, I'll definitely be doing a double triangulated four link. The next question is, of course, Nate, what is the best suspension for me to use on my vehicle? And there's no such thing as the best suspension for you to use on your vehicle or perfect suspension geometry or anything like that. The more that you build different vehicles and the more that you understand these concepts, you understand that you are making sacrifices and gains from column A to column B based on one design to the next. So it, anything automotive in my experience is all about compromise. You've got a bunch of extra horsepower from a supercharger. What are the drawbacks of a supercharger? And there are some. So this is this follows the same rule of thought. If you go to a triangulated four link versus a Watts link, what are the drawbacks? <laughs> there are some. So what I would recommend is use this, if you're a beginner, as a starter tool, as a bunch of new terms for you to go look up and investigate you know, a Watts link. Investigate these different types of suspension systems and figure out what's gonna work best for your vehicle. There's so many different makes and models of vehicle out there. And some people take Honda Civics and put them on straight axles and do crazy stuff like that. There's no one size fits all for that guy or for me or for you. And I think that the more you inform yourself on these different concepts, the better off you're gonna be on deciding which suspension style is gonna work best for your vehicle. So if you did enjoy this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Got a whole bunch of how-to content on here. Usually I build things, but every once in a while I do a video about concepts like this that people have been asking me to do for months and I just need to get around to doing it. So if you're into that kind of thing, definitely stick around. If you wanna help support the channel, you can go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We have t-shirts, hats, neck gaiters, all kinds of stuff. We also have a Patreon link there if you wanna help support us in that way as well. If you wanna follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.